it is so wonderful to finally meet you and you know after reading your incredible book um i just want to introduce the audience um to to, to my guest uh, dr partha mitter he is um an emeritus professor at Sussex University. Um, he's a member of World Wolfson College, Oxford, and an honorary fellow at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Um, he's held fellowships from Churchill College in Clare Hall, Cambridge, the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, the Getty Research Institute in Los Angeles, the Clark Art, Inst Art Institute, Williamston, um, National Gallery of Art, Washington, DC, um, he was also Radha Krishnan Memorial Lecturer at Old Souls College, Oxford. His books include Much Maligned Monsters, History of European Reactions to Indian Art, um, Art and Nationalism in Colonial India, 1850 to 1922, um, Indian Art, uh, the, the Triumph of Modernism, India's Artists in the Avant-Garde, 1922 to 1947. And this fourth book that we're going to be talking about most of all. At present, he's working on global modern art and its discontents, um, interventions, decentering modernism, art history, and avant-garde from the periphery. He's been working closely quite recently, and we'll talk about this later on, with uh, the Bauhaus Foundation in, in Berlin, then Dessau since 2009. Um, especially with the journal Bauhaus Imaginista. Um, so welcome, Dr. Mitter. It's just so wonderful to speak to you. With my first question, really, I want to ask the triumph of modernism, which we're discussing most of all here, was your fourth book. But, you know, going back to your first, the, you know, Maligned Monsters, you've been very interested in European interactions with Indian art and how Indian art was received, maligned, misinterpreted and otherwise dealt with it in, in its colonial contexts. So there was, you know, the great difficulty of coming to terms with Hindu, Hindu art, as you put it, in Maligned Monsters. Um, and then you later go on to talk about how European artists reproduced Hindu or Hindu Indian art broadly. What was the trajectory like from that very first book to the triumph of modernism? To put it very simply, the driving force is decolonization of the mind. Mm -hmm. Because <clears throat> after all, I was born in the twilight of empire and spent my youth in independent India. I also was a painter though I did my academic degree in history. I, I never became a painter. I always was a not near, nearly a painter, you know, or <laughs> painter monkey, as I call myself. Yeah. <laughs> now, so a question to me was, how do we explain our engagement with Western art? Because sometimes nationalists would say, oh, you're uh, uh, imitating them. I don't think that's true. And this is actually a political question. I used Indian art as an example. But that's only an example. Right. What I wanted to do was throw open the whole issue um, of decentering on a broader level. All countries, all our arts, I'm very interested in. So I'm, I was looking at the mechanism of European colonization. Right. Colonialism was predicated on the kind of concrete bulwark of cultural difference. That's a very important issue, as you know. Yeah. So how did it happen? The real intellectual revolution was the European Enlightenment, which was transformative. And we were all affected by that. I can't deny you are, we all Western educated elite. How can we right. avoid that? Yeah. So I, my task is uh, no less than decolonization of the mind. I think that one of the very important points that, you know, you make very early on, you make it in, in you know, the prologue to, to the book, really, essentially, which is that the, our understanding of the avant-garde and modernisms in general, and, and people often don't recognize the association between those two things, um, our, our understanding of it is, relies on a certain sense of cultural purity that does not exist, right? Absolutely. So, I've heard quite often people talk about the avant-garde as being too European a phenomenon, not particularly South Asian in that sense. And I and I think, you know, Rabindranath <laughs> Tagore and Amrita Shergel, for instance, who are in your book, um, are two examples of people who were during that period of the, of, you know, the early avant-garde in India and modernisms. And they really resisted this idea of, 
Indian art or like the cultural purity of Indian art because of their particular backgrounds and their particular yeah. trajectories as well. So how important was it to push back against that notion? It's a very important point. <clears throat> when I write, wrote my Triumph for Modernism, I was, uh, you might say, asking for trouble. I collapsed to modernism with avant-garde. Yeah. It was deliberate. It's claimed that um, modernism, modern, sort of coming to the East, in you know, a non-West. I might say on non-West because we mustn't forget Africa. We mustn't forget Americas. I mean, I'm very deeply committed to them. So uh, what you say is, yes, modern, yes, modernism. But you know, actual avant-garde is very revolutionary. It's all European. So I question that, you know, what is actually avant-garde? It's as bounce guard. It's, it's uh, radical, yeah. but then what are you rebelling against? Now, I know the obvious thing is that uh, avant-garde in the West, they're attacking, or oh, rightly challenging, uh, you know, classical academic paintings. You see what I mean? I mean, the 19th century, but also Renaissance art. Right. But uh, what about then India? Uh, where's avant-garde? Think carefully. And this is why I go back to art and nationalism. Mm -hmm. And this has now been discussed. I'll come to that. Uh, it's a very interesting issue that avant-garde, I'm um, in Vienna, there was a conference and I gave a paper questioning, uh, uh, you know, asserting that Pan-Asian movement, a regional form of avant-garde, uh, 1900, uh, Okakura, Tagore, etc. They were all challenging in painting the classical academic art. My uh, real grouses with the art history. They yeah. immediately constructed this. Oh, yes, the Bauhaus uh, colonized the world. Yeah, okay. it's all passive. And I said, no, this has to be strongly challenged. And this is where I studied, as you know, uh, the Bauhaus uh, um, uh, exhibition in Calcutta. It's the cosmopolitan avant-garde, the first transcultural avant-garde. Nobody talks about it, but we need to do that. Increasingly, this is where art history needs to be challenged. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's it. What a small thing. I've been doing that, of course, yeah. but I don't want to rest there. Let us also look at outside the Western, uh, the whole framework. We need to rethink our history, uh, loosen its, you know, this kind of underlying assumptions. I know, you know, Edward Said is very important, Orientalism, all these things are very important, but there is another aspect of art history. It's much more underground, it's underlying, you know, the agenda that you have this inherent idea that classical art is the best in the world and then transfer to modernism. Modernism is the original discourse. So everything is slightly later and derivative. So that, that, that's, you know, that's a process. As I go on, as I write, I learn more. Yeah. So, yeah, so go on. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you more. I mean, when you, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I find, I find some, but I'll, I'll get back to historiography in a, in a second, but I find it very interesting. So you, you know, in the book, you locate 1922, the, the exhibition in Calcutta as, you know, the start of, of, the, of the Indian avant-garde in a sense. And then there's, there's also a story which is very much, and you know, this is, you know, partly about, partly because the avant-garde was picked up by the Bengali elite and, you know, how it evolved from there. But there's a very interesting alliance with, you know, the people at the periphery, um, you know, especially the primitivists, for instance, maybe not all of them were at the periphery, but regardless, Indian primitivist art um, at the periphery found more allies with Western anti-colonialists than it did with its own academic artists in India and with mm -hmm. its own elite in India. Yes. Um, and that interesting connection it makes perfect sense when we think about the avant-garde as having roots in, you know, Marxist radical traditions, especially, right? So I think 
in that regard, that that's where historiography for me becomes a really big question, right? When when you were writing this book, it sounds like you were you of course you were writing about the Western anti-colonialists who were recognizing the rich pluralism of the peripheral avant-garde in India, but because you locate avant-garde in some of the marginal groups outside the traditional Hindu casteist structure, it seems like a story of an archive that some the people had missed before you before you wrote the book so what was the historical thinking on the avant-garde in india uh, oh avant-garde uh, it's rubbish india is not avant-garde so i said why do you say that what is avant-garde is that does it have to be always uh, the you know uh, all these uh, people tistan zara picasso duchamp they're mm -hmm. so avant-garde they're going around doing uh, outrageous things but that's not what it is what is the context? What are you challenging? Right. If you uh, look at any book on Indian art, general book, they start with um, five chapters on uh, Buddhist and Hindu art, two chapters just about on Mughal art, and one probably on modern art. I said we have to reverse it. Make it equal. All periods are important. You asked about subalterns. Yes. Only problem is you know, you and I um, can go and slam it as it were, stay with the um, tribal so-called, like a great artist, Mira Mukherjee, but they can't do, you know, but they can't come to Calcutta and stay with us, or yeah. they'd be very uncomfortable. So it's an imbalance. It yeah. is something which uh, I thought, think about. I feel very, you know, little worried, but what can I do? I wanted to just raise question. I want you and others to take it up. I mean, I can't do everything. I can at least <laughs> ask questions. It's yeah, great. absolutely. I mean, and this, I think, you know, segues really well to the, the next question that I wanted to ask you, which is just a very fascinating quote. Um, and, I, and I picked up on it because I was obviously self-consciously thinking about our project as well. So in the second chapter, right after you mention, you know, Rabindranath Tagore, Amrita Shergill, um, and their depictions of rural India and primitivism, you write, to be sure, this elite perception, their elite perception of the worth of the subalterns was necessarily from the perspective of otherness, but no less genuine for that. And that was incredibly intriguing to me and there was a certain meta moment in there because my perception my elite perception of the worth of you know the work that's happening in the peripheries in you know in bangla in in assamese in punjabi in many other languages in many dialects but not an anglophone south asian art or literature um i will still be coming from it and we in general anglophone south asians we would be coming from it from a perspective of otherness even if it might be good enough to be genuine so i'd i'd love to hear more about that what does otherness mean and is it okay. adequate I, to be genuine yeah, yeah. yeah. No, but one point i must quickly mention you know i was very fortunate to have had a very deep uh, you know uh, uh, um i mean uh, training and in uh, Bengali. I mean, I, I can read, uh, write, and speak, like, you know, like anybody else. I mean, I have a lot of, uh, I mean, I'm a Bengali in that sense, so I don't have that to worry, otherness. Uh, this is an interesting issue. You know, I can't deny that I don't belong to the, the you know, the so called, the subaltern, the the, but at least I can write about them with dignity. I want to move now to the the issue of gender because you you brought it up and also i think it is one of the the most intriguing parts of the book Very I mean, uh, you know but i have to be a bit personal i've I been mean, uh, at my age i'm uh, allowed that <laughs> yeah. uh, many years i have resisted being personal <clears throat> feminism i must confess being the only child in Calcutta, i didn't understand the problems of women, you know, and the deprivation, all levels, middle class, upper class, you know. I have to say that I, I learned, and this was my, I'm deeply grateful uh, from my wife. She was a great, I mean, I'm great not what I'm saying is that because, you know, she changed people's view of things. She's a very important figure. She worked on organizing the unorganized. Uh, her book, for instance, 
classic common fate, common bond. And yeah. it's wonderful because, uh, and th that's what she did. And we shared ideas. She felt that she learned from me the historian's empathy. So that, that was very interesting. Uh, it was a kind of uh, bargain for each other. Okay. Yeah. So I began to become more conscious. And uh, also a long time ago, Swasti said, why did you uh, work on women? Have a look. I mean, uh, part of your art. I said, yes, exactly. I knew women artists. So that's when I started, you see. And uh, in this book, of course, I've talked about Shergill, right? Mm -hmm. I I've tried to show different early women artists in different ways. Uh, Sunani Devi, from an aristocratic background, Tego's niece, but she was still sad. She still have, didn't have a status. Yeah. Outside. She was well, you know, looked after by her family, but she didn't have an independent status. And she wasn't think of, thought of as a prof professional, but Shergil was very important. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what we are, diaspora intellectual as an outsider. It's Franz Kafka's, you know, everyone's outsider. And you know, uh, Edward Said, Edward gave yeah. series, read lectures on the uh, intellectual as an outsider. The thing is that, um, uh, so Shergill, because she came from a privileged background, didn't suffer any insecurity. And she was always successful because of her looks, her position, and her, she uh, was very talented. And I found out more sort of looking at sort of women's status, you know, people like Goncharova, Goncharova modernist women in Russia was very radical. You know, they always still said that they were kind of, they looked up to the men, you know. Shergi was nobody's woman. You know, she was totally free. She always said it was only her. I know it is egotism, but it's also very important. So does that make sense? That's the thing. Which, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, Amrita Shergil, so I'll just, um, to recapitulate, you know, for the, for the, for the person who's watching this who might not know, she, she studied in Paris, she lived in Hungary before she moved to India and, you know, was, was depicting rural India, you know, and with, with a very like, you know, there was a tug. There's a push and pull relationship of hers, you know, of, of, of Indian art, of rejecting the Indian art of the time, but also rejecting the European art. Um, and the other part of that, of course, is that not only is she an independent artist who is not a housewife like Sonayani Devi was, but, but, a, but somebody who is, whose vocation was as an artist. She was also transparently bisexual. Her... Um, her sexuality. She never, she never concealed it. She was quite happy to be. Happy, yeah, right. That's and, a good thing. So that's what's very important. Yeah, yeah, and I think that that for you know for the time period that this, that this book is is focusing on, nineteen twenty two to nineteen forty five, it it is extremely surprising to the modern. It was surprising to me because there's something so contemporary about her being transparent about her erotic self. You know, her abortion, um, the male dominated profession she's in, and you draw a very interesting parallel between her and Frida Kahlo. Um, and I'm wondering if this is a problem that we have when we think about India's modernisms at large, not just Amrita Shergill. Is it anachronistic or useful to see the way the, the world Amrita Shergill was in is surprisingly similar to the one we perhaps occupy even still? A uh, very important point. Uh, let me say this. My point was that by the time Shergill passed away, she was very young. Yeah. And in the 50s, I mean, the, all the sort of uh, progressives, they admired her. But she was, uh, also you could see, formally, she was less radical than Jamie Roy. Yeah. I mean, I've written about it. Jamie Roy was really somebody who did things in parallel, didn't know one another with the German primitivists. The thing is that so she was old fashioned, but she's now very modern, us, you know, because people's time come, you know, often later because she was too advanced. Look at her personality. Look at the way it constructed herself. Mm -hmm. Did you find people at that period, in that period? No, it's now in the, again, the perspective of the uh, women's movement that you see her 
a great importance. Mm -hmm. And that's what I feel needs to be asserted and, you know, really probed. A very important figure. She, even in her willfulness, whatever we might call it, an outsider, but who was not afraid. She, she said, that's where I stand. You have to rethink history. And it is history, yes, you know, we can't deny that the West achieved so much and we have all, we've learned so much from the West. But West is not outside history. It's situated within history, within its context. And we need to think about that. And yeah. this, this is, of course, this is a very painful process. People are asking all over, how do we get out of this, as it were? Yeah. So, and this is a big thing for Rabindranath Tagore as well, right? Like he, yes, yes. He much resisted this idea that there is something such as Indian art, right? Like he, he was, he had a very, you know, transnational, but also, you know, he resisted the cultural purity that, you know, always, was always, always for, right? And, and I think that that is, you know, I think when, I think we sometimes don't fully realize how much we're relying on an idea of cultural purity. So for instance, whenever somebody, I, I think now personally, having having read your your work and others, and, and you know, I, I fig understood what, what literature it was that I was growing up on, uh, whenever somebody says something like, that, you know, the avant-garde doesn't have much connection to South Asia or, you know, to, to Pakistani life as you were living it or whatever. I think, well, you're resting on this assumption of cultural purity, which is, it, it's something that can never exist, right? So in that sense, I, I guess it's a myth. one it's question a myth. I have is, one question that I have is, are these historical figures embodiments of syncretism, you know, in that sense? That's an interesting issue. Um, what I could say about this, of course, the idea of purity is absolute myth. And this whole fear of hybridity and, you know, infection, we don't want to be infected with. Yeah. You know, absolutely. I mean, that's been such a case. But the, uh, this goes back to 19th century, all these ideas, you know, of race and so on. Uh, do, do you see what I mean? Yeah. So that, that's one of the issues. Can we think of a kind of interface or perhaps, you know, you have these, I'll tell you what it is. I mean, whether that makes sense, I don't know. I'm still developing this idea. It's still in a very rough state. I, I've called it virtual cosmopolis. Yeah. Uh, it's very important. Because what I have asked, <clears throat> when you have all this, uh, you know, a circulation of, Modernism, how is it done? What is the way? Now you can say, uh, you know, I've written a little bit about it and started developing it that, uh, so you always have this idea that West is circular, you know, offering these things and the non-West is absolutely so grateful. I call it for the artist because of monkey syndrome. It could never be because of that. <laughs> anyway, so uh, I thought that Look at it historically. There were great um, movements in the 19th century, which was actually, uh, which were inspired by colonials, you know, about uh, European expansion, yes. Yeah. But they were, the, they, they were the agents, but not the only agents. Modernism is a product of West and non-West, and this is always forgotten, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. the, so, uh, what you have is uh, the colonial countries, Britain, France, and Spain, as it were, and Portugal. The language has become hegemonic, you know, English, an English speaking world, French, and then um, Spanish Portuguese. Okay, that brings in ideas from, let's say, internationally, but you might say from the West. Yeah. Well, what happens? A person, let's say in the periphery, let, let's say sitting, I'm thinking of pre-colonial period, let's say somewhere, uh, even South America or India, the person in the periphery couldn't care less probably, but they, I like Bengali literature, enormous um, wealth, but they were not concerned with the West. They, they, they were not translated. They spoke within themselves. What I would like to say that I found Bakhtin's idea very interesting. 
that yeah. you take the idea, you transform it according to your own worldview, and you say, create new things. This is a modality continuously develops. Even American philosophers were took, looking towards India to construct their world. They wanted to rebel. Uh, they wanted to get away from European philosophy. So they turned to. So this is the. It's all on virtual level. Uh, print technology, print culture, yeah. and this uh, leads to this kind of exchanges and creation of new literature, new forms of thought. Mm -hmm. You see, that I, for me, it's a very interesting idea. I want to develop more gradually. I'm sort of putting it forward, but um, a very poor, not very, that poor, uh, school teacher in, let's say, uh, Calcutta or even Bengal has no idea about Europeans, but he reads and she reads these things and creates their own world. One of the great examples is wonderful writer Niraj C. Chowdhury. Yeah. He didn't see many Europeans until he was in his 30s. He didn't see, uh, you know, the country Britain until the 60s. But he was so interested in creating things out of the enlightenment idea. So enlightenment is something which spread, but in a very different way, different parts of the world. It's not the same. And I, I, that is why I feel that, why should it always be seen as one way? Because the West was also gaining from African art. I mean, come on, you don't, you know, admit, you know a lot of people don't admit that. You yeah. See. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think one of the most, one of the wonderful things about the book for me is how, I mean, I think particularly with Rabindranath Tagore, because everyone's heard of him, you know, even though they may not have, may not know much about his painting, um, his influences from African tribal art and, you know, all sorts of indigenous, you know, work, um, there was... Yeah, the 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 sculptor who was working on Santal art, for instance, Ram um, King, Ram King, yes, yeah, he um, he was very influenced by English and French avant gardes, but he was you know really trying to depict the the Santal the Santal people. Oh, yes, no, no, absolutely, uh, he was very interesting. Yes, of course, and he came from a sort of subaltern group. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I mean, there was definitely that English and French admixture. So, but this is why Shantinikatan is so important, Tagore's university. You know, now he's being reappreciated. I'm quite amused by it. The last 10 years, people are reading Tagore again. Yeah. You know, it's very interesting. Yeah, I didn't, I did to be honest, I didn't grow up with, a, with my, I mean, I think this might also be a Pakistan specific thing. Um, and also leads me to my next question. But um, I think, you know, growing up, I'm, I, I don't know if I had an appreciation for Tagore. I think it's only now that I'm going back and being like, hmm, what did I miss? What was it critical? I don't know, know why, partly. Partly because English speaking people, we are, I'm, I'm I speak in the, Bengali, but most of English speaking people, uh, they don't know Tagore, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's so not they not to, do, you, do you feel that? I, I don't think it's, I mean, yes, I agree with you, but it's not so much, for me, it wasn't so much, you know, from being an English speaking background, even though, you know, I was. Um, it was more that it was a, we were a Punjabi family. So, you know, the names that I was familiar with were, were Manto, Ismat Chaftai, and then later, and much more recently, I've come to like an appreciation of Kurutula and Heather, but she was in my, uh, you know, my mother was a big Kurutula and Heather fan when I was younger. And it was only, it's only recently, actually, that I went back to Kurutula and Heather and I was like, this is syncretistic work. And I didn't appreciate yes. that. Yes, uh, I know what you mean. So, yeah. yeah. That way, syncretism is a very interesting idea. It seems to me like the, the story of the avant-garde had some special relationship with, um, with, Beng with, Beng with the Bengali elite in particular and with Bengali subalterns. And I'm wondering, you know, if because the, the triumph of modernism is from 1922 to 47. Yes, it's a period. Yeah, yes. so post-partition, are we... First of all, why was it that Bengal was 
you know, the real, the first, the first original recipient that we can really trace back with regards to avant-garde work. And second, what is the story then proceeding from 47? Yes, very good point. Now, you see, it might be a historic accident. One of the reasons the Bengalis were, you know, in that sense, you know, uh, very au fait were the first cosmopolitans, simply because of the accident of colonialism, the first to be colonized, right? That, yeah. That's an important point. After the 30s, I don't talk about that because that was yet another very different, I mean, how much can you cover? Yeah. And my publisher wasn't happy with already the length. The thing is that 30s, you find all over very radical approach emerging. One of the things was strong uh, communist or Marxist movement. And artists were deeply affected by that. And you have all the way. I mean, in London, you have Mulk Rajananda, you know, part of Marxist kind of thing. In Bengal, um, particularly the famine, um, uh, you know, um, the whole lot of artists were very radical, you see. Now, my great favorite is Zainul Abedin, wonderful artist. But there were others. They all were very strong, radical. And a lot of communists, Puchita Prasad, you know, they were, um, you know, representing the people as it were. So that's another story. Uh, when treated uh, by different people. Then you come to Bombay, the progressives. And I've been a person where I've been very close to them. Mm -hmm. And they belong to another era because they are really properly 1947 onwards. Trump is talking about this early avant-garde. And then Hussein, Raza, Souza, uh, you know, Christian Khanna, they take over this period. And then they 40s, and of course, I was very close to them. Keku Gandhi, a very dear friend, mm -hmm. and all these people. And so, yes, so does that make sense? And then, of course, artists um, in Pakistan uh, that were very important. My again, uh, great favorite is Sadiqan, wonderful artist. Yes, yeah, yes, I, I was very fortunate and deeply moved by a friend of mine, Hamid Harun, brought me the whole. Aslada came for me, carried it all the way from uh, Karachi. Yeah, he's a very close friend and people like that. So, yes, I mean, that was emerging. And I do feel that we have to start, and I can't say that I've got all the answers, but to try and within the whole framework, you know, not everything non Western is great. That would be, you know, it would mm -hmm. defeat his purpose. Yeah. How do we start to make judgments of value? Our project is very much focused on being, you know, historically informed. But, you know, it's, it's, it's trying to charge into the present with a very radical, experimental and dissident approach to the art. Even to the point of picking up the label of avant-garde. And that has a complex relationship with public audiences. You know, we found that I think a lot of people respond to avant-garde in a particular way and so we have to we're both interrogating it while at the same time informing right that that relationship i think for the project is is incredibly important and so i'm wondering what advice would you have for things that that charge into the future like that uh, one thing i have to say it's a it's very much ongoing debate it's going on at the moment and it's very naturalist method See, because it's now us, you know, we can't often, often see what's going to happen in the future. Future gels, present doesn't gel. Yeah. So uh, how do you do it? One of the things uh, I find this in, among Indian artists, for instance, this kind of um, parodying the past, denying the past, because of this problem of colonial chronology, the whole idea of progress. So if you deny the past, deny history, then, you can, but you can't do that. And that's what I would say that do not deny. And so, so we have to build this up slowly. It's a composite picture. You cannot, there's a final say, let's put it this way. Mm -hmm. But I do worry about my friends, European artists, that they still can't see the, importance of non-European art. You were a student of 
the famous Marxist historian Eric Hobsbawm. Yes. And um, firstly, what was that like? And secondly, yeah, wonderful. Um, the made... lectures were amazing. Yeah. Absolutely. And I owed my, well, first class to him. Uh, I mean, yes, yes. I listened carefully to what he told us. Others didn't, probably. I did. And yeah. that was very, yeah. No, but I admire him. He's a wonderful lecturer. And his whole lectures on how modern society developed, railways, all sorts of things. So he's not a conventional Marxist. Yeah, I mean, for me personally, Hobbsbaum was, um, you know, he was a sort of childhood hero of mine. And so I think that, um, you know, just because I, those books were so formative in my historical historical thinking, um, for, for one reason or another, Hobbsbaum was was the person who, you especially, you know, that trilogy, the Age of Empire, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that trilogy just was very important to me. And obviously then he had a book on, he had, he wrote about jazz, which is something. Oh, but, but you know, he was a, a jazz critic of New Statesman. You know that. Quite fascinating. I think Newton. Wonderful. When we talk about the processes of decolonizing the mind and the category of the avant-garde today, as we proceed as artists, you know, and historians, but also artists. Um, what, what, what do you think that means in terms of what we have to try to do and how we have to try to think in terms of our work and its relation to, and you talked about power, but it, its relation to the languages we operate in, the cultures mm -hmm. that we are oh. interacting with. And Absolutely. do we, do we have to have, I guess what I'm, what my real question is, is, is decolonization of the mind an understanding or coming to, coming to grips with the, the inevitable and, at the, and the influence of the West as admixtured with the, with the non-West, which is where, where we are originally from, right? So I'm wondering what, what part of that process um, what, what is that process, I think, is the real question. Okay, very, a very, very important. You raised an absolutely crucial question. Uh, let me put it this way. It is a collective enterprise. And I'm indebted to so many people whose works, especially post-colonial, post-modern, you know. I mean, I can think of my colleague, um, Ranjit Gohad, a very important figure. He showed things in a way that was so important so many other people in their own ways. I'm not a very obvious kind of radical, but I think my works are very radical, but I don't shout too much. Um, but the thing is that I learned from others, lots of other ones, you know, the whole post-colonial world, post-modern world. Um, and the thing is that it's a process, can I put it this way? It's a, it's a, it's a joint enterprise. We have to work towards it, and that's uh, this is your again, uh, you know, uh, your uh, area. And I would like to, of course, as uh, we'll talk more about your project. I'd love to hear because I, I was very excited uh, to hear what you're doing. It's very important. Um, yes, because that's what we need at the moment, and it's happening in other parts of the world. But I'm glad that you raised it. Uh, it's happening to some extent in Germany. So. Uh, what can I say? Um, there's no simple answers. It's not all or nothing. It's a, it's a process of gradually learning through um, trial and error, I would say. I mean, my main purpose from my you know, early days, um, not when I was writing my dissertation, I didn't think so much about it. Um, but um, I always think of, that I want to raise questions. I'm not a f fantastically meticulous scholar. Every single word needs to be, and I, that's my limitation, but I don't care. Mm. I want you to think, all of you, everyone, to, what's it about? How can we really you know, ask new questions? And that's what I was very fortunate having had to. Hosman was very important, but more important, um, Ernst Gomri changed my life, my whole outlook. I was in India, 
straightforward Marxist and kind of much more interested in Hegel, uh, of course, I mean, we all were. But I, he opened my eyes, his first lecture, very first, amazingly, in London, I was my stu his student, I had a big lecture. Uh, and his view of, his critique of Hegel absolutely stunned me, and that was the beginning. But the thing is that he was limited. He didn't understand non-European culture, except Chinese a little bit. Mm -hmm. And he admitted it, he never denied it. But what I learned from him was to question. He, all, he told me that it's more important to question than to find final answers. And I think that's a wonderful uh, you know, idea. And I, I've always followed it. And I love, and I want everyone to you know, ask further questions from this. So this is why I found very exciting what you, and every single thing you said were of significance. And we must think a lot, we have to think about a lot and develop, absolutely. Thank you so much for speaking with me. Um, it's so lovely to talk to you about your work.